You didn't believe that you were gonna die. You didn't believe there will be accountability. You didn't believe that the angel will come. Today, you will pay the price. The earth on which you stole, the earth on which you fornicated, the earth on which you lied, the earth on which you went to the nightclub, that earth will begin to say, Oh Allah, I saw him, he was here. This dunya is deceiving. Why? Because everything with this dunya will come to an end and this dunya will also come to an end. Respected ulama, my respected elders, my brothers, my sisters, and my little ones. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. After praising the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and sending salutations on Nabiya Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I begin as always by first thanking you, my host, for giving me this opportunity to convey the message of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And I pray to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah accepts these efforts of yours in listening to this message in the late hours of the night. As I pray to the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that Allah accepts these efforts of mine in trying to deliver the message of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. My young friends, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in His glorious book, he says, O Muslimano, Every soul shall taste death. Irrespective of who you are, what you are, where you are, how big you may be, seven foot, eight foot, Every soul will taste death. Everyone has a fixed time. Five years, ten years, fifty years. You might even make it to a hundred. Everyone has a fixed time. لكل أمة أجل. إذا جاء أجلهم فلا يستأخرون عنه ساعة ولا يستقدمون. And when that fixed time comes, then my young friend, there will not be delay, not even for a zillionth of a second. Thereafter. إِنَّمَا تُوَفَّوْنَ أُجُورَكُمْ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ You will receive your reward in full, good or bad. What is success? What to have a fat car, a million dollars in your bank account, going around with women to your right and women to your left? Is this success? Allah is saying, فَمَنْ زُحْزِهَا عَنِ النَّارِ وَأُدْخِلَ الْجَنَّةَ فَكَدْ فَازِ Success, whoever can save himself from the eternal punishment, punishment that will not come to an end, but will increase by the second, pain beyond the comprehension of the human mind. Whoever can save himself from that Jahannam and he's admitted under, into gardens under which rivers flow, he is the one that has succeeded. My young friend, do not be deceived by that BMW that you may drive. Do not be deceived by that Jaguar or the fat Range Rover that you may have. Do not be deceived by the bungalows that you may live in. Tall, lofty buildings, beautiful houses, the beautiful clothes that you may wear, 
Do not be deceived by this dunya. Why? وَمَا الْحَيَاةُ الدُّنْيَا إِلَّا مَتَاءُ الْغُرُورُ This dunya is deceiving. Why? Because everything with this dunya will come to an end and this dunya will also come to an end. كُلُّ مَنْ عَلَيْهَا فَانُ وَيَبْقَى وَجْهُ رَبِّكَ ذُو الْجَلَالِ وَالْإِكْرَامِ There is only one thing to remain and that is none other than the Lord of the Arsh and Kursi, the creator of the dunya. Other than this, Every single thing will perish. Say, O Muhammad, قل, tell these people, إِنَّ الْمَوْتَ الَّذِي تَفِرُّونَ مِنْ فَإِنَّهُ مُلَاقِيكُمْ You know this, dead, this death that you're running away from? And you and I at this moment in time are running away from death. We really don't believe it. You know, we might not say with our mouths that we don't believe in death. We may acknowledge it, yeah, because we've seen people go before us. So we may say we believe, but our actions are a proof that we don't believe. You see the massage is full on a Friday. You see the massage is full today. You'll see the massage is full on the day of Eid. But the rest of the year, my young friend, tomorrow come Fajr Salah, you will see one or two stuffs inside this masjid. And the same goes around for every other masjid in this country. When it's time for salah, we become deaf and blind to the teachings of Allah and His Rasul. When it's time for zakah, we become deaf and blind to the teachings of Allah and His Rasul. When it's time for hajj, we become deaf and blind to the teachings of Allah and His Rasul. Our a'mal are saying that we don't believe in death. We're running away from death. Allah is saying, you tell them, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you can run wherever you like. You can go in the depths of the Atlantic, in the total darkness. My friend, you can climb the peak of the Everest. My friend, you can hide in the darkness of the Amazon or the Kalahari bush. When your time comes to an end, wherever you are, walu kuntum fi burujim wa They say the Pentagon and Fort Knox are places where no one can penetrate and get through. You can go and hide there. When your time comes to an end, all of a sudden, the barrier will be removed from your eyes. You're in the dunya, but now you can see the akhirah. And you will see that angel standing before you wherever you are in any corner of the globe. You cannot escape. You could be Bill Gates and you can possess billion and billions of dollars. My friend, you can take the virgin spaceship and go to space. You can try what you like. When your time comes to an end, believe or not believe, you will see that angel standing before you. He will get you. Then, ثُمَّ تُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ آلِمِ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ ثُمَّ تُرَدُّونَ إِلَىٰ آلِمِ الْغَيْبِ وَالشَّهَادَةِ Every one of us, we will return to the knower of the seen and the unseen. Every one of us will return to the absolute master. You know, at this moment in time, you may do wrong. You know what? You want to do wrong? You can do wrong. Your mother and father won't find out. You probably go all the way to the nightclubs in Luton, making sure that none of your mother or father or any one of your relatives have a clue to what you do. But you know what? He is watching every single thing that you do and every word that your tongue utters, he knows of it and he will inform you of every single thing that you've done. For you not be okum bima kuntum ta'maloon. He will inform you of every single thing. The angels recording your deeds, my young friend. You can't hide and you will not get away. The angels recording your deeds, they will inform him of what you did. And you want to try denying? Then my friend, the very earth on which you wronged him, إِذَا زُلْزَلَتِ الْأَرْضُ زِلْزَالَهَا وَأَخْرَجَتِ الْأَرْضُ أَثْقَالَهَا وَقَالَ الْإِنسَانُ مَا لَهَا يَوْمَئِذٍ تُحَدِّثُ أَخْبَارَهَا بِأَنَّ رَبَّكَ أُحَالَهَا The earth on which you stole, the earth on which you fornicated, the earth on which you lied, the earth on which you went to the nightclub, that earth will begin to say, Oh Allah, Abdullah was here on the 29th of December at 10.30. Oh Allah, 
I saw him, he was here. And if you still try to deny, يَوْمَ تَشْهَدُ عَلَيْهِمْ أَلْسِنَتُهُمْ وَأَيْدِيهِمْ وَأَرْجُلُهُمْ بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ Then my young friends, you know, you say that these body parts are yours. They belong to you. These hands belong to you. This tongue which is speaking at this moment in time, that belongs to you. You know, uh, these legs belong to you. But on that day, my young friend, you will realize that you don't even have control over, the th over your own tongue. You have no control over your own hands. You will have no control over your own feet. My friend, even they will not be loyal to you. Balke on that day, when you stand before the Lord of the Arsh and Kursi, you're saying to Allah, Oh Allah, no, I did not do this wrong. Oh Allah, no, I didn't commit this sin. You know your hands, they will begin to speak and say, oh Allah, no, he's lying. He committed this sin. Your feet will begin to speak and your feet will begin to say, no Allah, he did commit this sin. You're trying to say something with your tongue, but you will find that you have no control over your own tongue. And your tongue will bear witness against you and say, oh Allah, indeed Abdullah committed this sin and I'm a witness to this. Aman, Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala and relates, a man came to Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And he asked, Ya Rasulullah man akyasun nas. Who is the wisest and the most cautious of all men? Who is the clever man? O Messenger of Allah, is it one who graduates as a doctor? Is it one who becomes a teacher? Is it a mechanic? Is it a builder? Is it a scientist? Is it a hafiz? Is it an alim? Oh, Ya Rasulullah, who is the wisest and cleverest of all men? So Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, Al-kayyisu man dana nafsahu wa amila lima ba'd al-mawd wal-ajizu man ajba nafsu hawahu wa tamanna ala Allah. The wise man and the clever man is he who suppressed his desires, who controlled his nafs. His nafs was telling him to commit zina, but no, he controlled his nafs. His nafs was telling him to look at a haram woman, but he controlled his nafs. His nafs was telling him to go wine and dine. No, he controlled his nafs for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And he put pressure on his nafs and he would make muhasaba every night. He would hold himself accountable. He would ponder over the deeds that he's done, good or bad. My friends, Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, and then he would work day and night for the real life. The life that is to come after death. A life which will never end. And as a result, he would fast, he would pray, he would go for hajj, he would help the poor and needy. Nabi Kareem wasallam said, he is the wisest of all men. He is the wisest of all men. He's realized his purpose in creation. He knows he's only here for a few days. He knows this is only a small journey. He has to get to the Akhirah. That is the ultimate abode. That is the real abode. That is the final abode. He makes preparations for the real life. Whilst in the dunya, he is the wisest and cautious of all men. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala who relates, Irtahalati dunya mudbira. وَارْتَحَلَتِ الْآخِرَةُ مُكْبِلَ As every day passes, this dunya is coming to an end. For everything there's a fixed time. For everything there's a fixed time. There's a fixed time even for the heavens and the earth. Every day passes, every second passes, this dunya is coming to an end, and the akhirah, the next life, the hereafter, is coming closer and closer and closer. وَلِكُلِّ وَاحِدٍ مِّنْهُمَا بَنُونَ And each one of the two. The dunya has children and the akhirah has children. The dunya has people and sons inclined towards it. You know, people that work day and night just to acquire pounds and pounds. People that work day and night so they can buy five cars. People that work day and night so they can buy two, three bungalows. The dunya has children. The akhirah has children. Those that suppress their desires and try their utmost best to please Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wasallam and do as much good as they possibly can. Each one of the two has children. Sayyidina Ali radiallahu ta'ala says, O oh Muslimano, wisen up. La tukunu min abna'i dunya. La tukunu min abna'i dunya. 
O Muslimano, فَكُونُوا مِنْ أَبْنَاءِ الْآخِرَةِ Become the sons of the Akhira. Those that work for the hereafter, those that strive and sacrifice to acquire the pleasure of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, wisen up, become the sons of the Akhira. Do not become the sons of the dunya. Why? فَإِنَّ الْيَوْمَ أَمَلٌ وَلَا حِسَابٌ While you're alive at this moment in time, and you're breathing, you're in the dunya, you have this opportunity to perform good, to do good. وَلَا حِسَابٌ And whilst you're here, my young friend, there is no accountability. Allah will not hold you account to anything. But tomorrow, tomorrow, غَدًا حِسَابٌ وَلَا عَمَلٌ Tomorrow you say to the Lord of the Arsh and Kursi, Oh Allah, I beg you, لَوْ أَنَّ لِي كَرَّةٌ فَنَكُونَ مِنَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ Oh Allah, I beg you, give me another chance. Send me back to that dunya and I will believe. I will declare the kalima, لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا اللَّهِ مُحَمَّدَ رَسُولَ اللَّهِ Oh Allah, I will put my head in prostration and I will not get out of prostration till you take my soul from my body. Oh Allah, I will donate in your path. I will help the poor needy. Oh Allah, I beg you, just give me one chance and I will prove it to you and I will show you how good a pious servant I am, an obedient servant I am. My young friends, on that day, you can beg as much as you like. You can ask as many times as you like. غَدًا حِسَابٌ وَلَا عَمَلٌ On that day, you will not be given the opportunity to go back in the dunya and prove yourself. You only have one chance. It is up to you. Either from the Ashab Al-Yameen, either from the Ashab Al-Shimal, there will be hisab, there will be accountability. You will be asked with regards to your salah. You will be asked with regards to your zakah. You will be asked with regards to the people. My friends, an umrihi fi ma afna, wa an shababihi fi ma abla, wa an malihi min ayna iqtasaba, wa fi ma anfaqa, wa an ilmihi maza amila fi. You will be asked with regards to your youth. Every day of your youth, when you were strong and you could worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, because you had the strength to do a lot of good deeds, you will be asked, how did you spend your days of youth? One umrihi fi ma abna. Your life, we gave you 80 years. We gave you 65 years. We told you what your purpose in creation was. Tell me, what did you do with the 65 years of life that I gave you? One amalihi, one ilmihi maza amila fi. With regards to the knowledge that you had, how did you act upon it? Where you got this wealth from? Where did you spend it? My friends, on that day, every single deed that you perform, every word that your tongue uttered, there will be accountability. There will be accountability. My young friend, it doesn't come any simpler than this. You know, you do not need to be a rocket science. This is not rocket science. It does not come any more simpler than this. It does not come any more plainer than this. And it does not come any easier than this. Simple. فَكُونُوا مِنْ أَبْنَاءِ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا تُكُونُوا مِنْ أَبْنَاءِ الدُّنْيَا فَكُونُوا مِنْ أَبْنَاءِ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا تُكُونُوا مِنْ أَبْنَاءِ الدُّنْيَا And today, all I've come to do is ask you one simple question. And this question that I ask you is, my young friends, what choice will you make? What path will you choose? Will you choose the Ashab al-Yameen? The path of those on the right? Or will you choose the Ashab al-Shimal? The path of those on the left. Will you be min abna'i dunya from the sons of the dunya that give preference to the dunya over the akhirah? Or my young friend, will you be the sons of the akhirah? You give preference to Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa And you give preference to the real life over this life. Simple question, what path will you choose? What path will you choose? And throughout this talk today, this is the question that I want you to bear in mind. And before you leave this gathering, I want you to answer this question on your own accord. But before you do this, let me help you today by relating to you the consequence of one that gives preference to this life and lives a life of neglect rejecting the teachings of Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and whining and dining. One that gives preference to the dunya over the akhirah. Let me just relate to you very briefly today. The surprise is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for him. Sayyidina Usman Ghani radiallahu ta'ala anhu, the third khalif of Islam. Relating with regards to him, Kikana Uthman, إِذَا وَقَفَ عَلَىٰ قَبَرْ بَكَاحَةَ تَبُلَّ لَيْحَتُهُ 
Sayyidina Usman Ghani radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when he would stand next to a grave, tears would begin to flow from his eyes. So many tears would flow from the eyes of Sayyidina Usman Ghani radiallahu ta'ala anhu, that the blessed beard of Sayyidina Usman Ghani radiallahu ta'ala anhu would become white. And the people would say to Usman Ghani, O oh Usman, تُذْكَرُ الْجَنَّةِ وَالنَّارِ فَلَا تَبْكِي وَتَبْكِي مِنْ حَاذَا O oh Usman, the mention of Jannat and Jahannam is made. Yet you don't cry when the mention of Jannat and Jahannam is made. When the mention of the grave is made, O oh Usman, you cry so much, so much that your blessed beard becomes wet. Sayyidina Usman Ghani radiallahu ta'ala responded, Ya O Muslimano, I've heard Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say, Ya inna al-qabr awwalu manazil al-akhirah. Qabr, the grave, is the first stage of the stages of the hereafter of the Akhirah. فَإِنَّ جَامِنْ Whoever succeeds at the stage of the grave, he will find فَمَا بَعْدُهُ أَيْسَرْ مِنْ That every stage that is coming thereafter will be easy for him. The plane of resurrection will be more easier than the grave. And every stage that comes thereafter will become easy and easy and easy till he will enter paradise. وَإِنْ لَمْ يَنْجُ مِنْ but if he doesn't succeed at this stage inside the grave, when the angels Munkar and Nakir and come and pose the question, Man Rabbuk Ma Dinuk, Man Rajul, he will find Fama Ba'du Ashad Min that every stage that is to come thereafter, the plane of resurrection, the accountability, and then Jannah and Jahannam and the billions and billions and zillions, eternity, my friends. He will find that every stage thereafter will be zillions and zillions of times more difficult. Zillions and zillions of times more difficult. This is why I say, my young friends, you know, if you want to believe, then you believe. If you don't want to believe, if you don't want to believe in Allah and His Rasul, if you don't want to believe in the Akhirah, then my friends, the choice is yours. Don't believe. Allah says, فَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيُؤْمِنْ وَمَنْ شَاءَ فَلْيَكْفُرْ Nobody will be forced to declare the kalima لا إله إلا الله لا إكراه في الدين Nobody will be forced to accept, embrace Islam and accept the kalima لا إله إلا الله You want to believe? You believe. You don't want to believe? Don't believe. You want to reject Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Then my friend, you reject Allah and His Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You want to give preference? to the dunya over the akhirah and you want to enjoy this life you know the 50 years that you might get the 60 years that you might get and if you're lucky you get a hundred years you want to enjoy this and you want to give this preference to the eternal bliss in paradise then my friend it's your choice you do this you want to live a life whining and dining you want to live a life pubbing and clubbing you want to live a life chilling and thrilling then my friend you do this well, let me tell you, you know what? The last laugh will be with none other than the Lord of the Arsh and Kursi. The last laugh will be with none other than the Lord of the Arsh and Kursi. Because Rasulullah wasallam said, You do as you please, but remember, تَمُوتُونَ كَمَا تَحْيَوْنَ وَتُحْشِرُونَ كَمَا تَمُوتُونَ You will die just like you lived. You will die just like you lived. And you will be resurrected on the day of judgment, just like you died. كُلُّ عَبْدٍ يُبْعَثْ أَلَى مَا مَاتَ عَلَيْهِ you will die just like you lived. You know, if you've lived whining and dining, chilling and thrilling, and giving preference to the dunya over the akhirah, and then you think in your little mind that on the point of death, you will utter the kalima la ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, or you will die reciting dhikr, or sending salutations on Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, or you will die in the state of prostration, then my friend, people like you and me are living in cuckoo land. We're living in cuckoo land. If we believe that we reject Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, then we're going to die with a kalima la ilaha illallah. Then we're kidding none other than ourselves. Just as it is hoped 
That one who pleases Allah and His Rasul and suppresses his desires and gives preference to the Akhirah over the dunya, Allah will honor him at the time of death. It's so possible that Allah takes out his soul when he's in the state of prostration, when he's bowing down before the Lord of the Arshun Kursi in prayer. prayer. Oh, Allah takes out his soul when he's woken up during the night and his hands are raised before his master and he's begging for Allah's mercy. Oh my friends, Allah takes his soul while he's sitting in the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam before the roza offering salams to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam or he's in the masjid haram in the stay of a haram making tawaf around the house of Allah just as it is hope that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will honor that individual who gives preference to the akhirah over the dunya it is feared one who gives preference to the dunya over the akhirah and rejects the teachings of Allah and his Rasul and neglects his obligation to Allah and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam my friends, it is feared that Allah will disgrace him at the time of death. Allah will disgrace him at the time of death. And if Allah disgraces him at the time of death, then you tell me, what do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for him? Thereafter, in the grave, day of judgment, and Jahannam. Sayyidina Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu, when occasion was traveling, night, he decides to stop with an old woman in her house. All of a sudden, there's a grave nearby, and at night, the great companion of Rasulullah, the son of Umar Farooq, he can hear a voice coming from the grave. The voice is crying, Bowl wa ma bowl, shan wa ma shan. Drops of urine. Which drops of urine? Shan wa ma shan. Water bag of leather. Which water bag of leather? Sayyidina Abdullah ibn Umar radiallahu ta'ala anhu is shocked. He asked the old woman with regards to this voice, Who is this individual? Why is he saying the words, Bowl wa ma bowl, shan wa ma shan? She explains, This was her husband. This man inside this grave, uttering these words, Bowl wa ma bowl, shan wa ma shan, is none other than her husband. He was negligent with regards to drops of urine at the time of making istanja. He wouldn't do istibra. He wouldn't listen. She would tell him not to be negligent. She would tell him to be cautious, but he wouldn't pay heed to the teachings of Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. She would say to him, he, even animals are better than you. When they relieve themselves, when they urinate, even they, camels spread their legs so as not to pollute their own bodies. But he wouldn't pay heed. She says from the day he has died, he's been saying these words, bowl wa ma bowl, shan wa ma shan. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inside his grave is punishing him with regards to the sin that he would commit in the dunya and which he took very lightly. So he asked, why does he say the words shan wa ma shan? Water bag of leather, which water bag of leather? She explained that one occasion, a man dying of thirst came knocking our door begging for some water. So he pointed to a, a water bag of leather. He was taking the mick. So he pointed to a, a water bag of leather saying that this water bag is full of water, uh, this uh, leather bag is full of water, take it, drink it. So this person, when he took the water bag of leather and realizing there was no water, he collapsed on the spot and he died. She says, from that day onwards, when he died, every night, this is what I hear from the grave. He's crying inside the grave. The angels are punishing him. And this is what we hear. Bowl wa ma bowl. Shan wa ma shan. Drops of urine. Which drops of urine? Water bag of leather. Which water bag of leather? Sayyidina Abdullah bin Umar radiallahu ta'ala, when he related, returned to Madinah al Manawara. And he related this to our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is when Nabi Karim sallallahu alayhi wa sallam forbade the Sahaba from traveling alone. Rabi ibn Shabra ibn Ma'bad al-Juhni kan abidan bil Basra was from amongst the awliya Allah of Basra. He relates this, he says, in Sham, I was present on one occasion at the time of death of a believer. In Sham, Syria, at the time of death of a believer. And he says the people were doing talqeen, they were Telling him to read the kalima la ilaha illallah. Just as we do here today when somebody is on, on uh, uh, the point of death, we make talqeen. We read the kalima aloud in front of him so that he also follows us and he reads the kalima. Why? Because Rasulullah sallallahu said, Man kana akhiru kalamihi la ilaha illallah. Dakhal al-jannah. Whoever recites the kalima la ilaha illallah. Whoever last words are the kalima la ilaha illallah. 
Be sure that this individual will enter paradise. This is why we try our utmost best. That this dying person before he leaves this world, he utters the kalima, La ilaha illallah Muhammad Rasulullah. So this dying believer, they're making talqeen. They're encouraging him. If before him, they're reciting the kalima, La ilaha illallah. Maybe he will follow them in their footsteps. My friends, dying moments, and he's telling, he's telling all those people around him, he's saying to them, Ishrab wasqini. He's saying the words, Ishrab waskini. He's telling all those around him to have a drink, take some alcohol, have a glass of wine. And he's saying to them, Waskini, give me a glass of wine to drink. Did I not say, my young friends, you know, we give preference to the dunya over the akhirah, and then we believe, we wine and dine our lives, and then at the time of death, you know, if you and I think that we're going to die with the kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, then we are not conning anyone other than ourselves. We live in Kukulan. He spent his life like this. Time of death. What he was used to, like Rasulullah wasallam said, Tamutun kama tahyon. You will die just like you lived, and you will be resurrected on the day of judgment just like you died. And on his deathbed, he's asking for intoxicants. Asking for intoxicants. Amman in Ahwaz related, time of death. And at the time of death, rather than reading the kalima, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah, my young friends, he's counting money. Five, ten, twenty pounds, hundred pounds. Now he was probably an accountant. You know, one that spent all his life, had no time for Allah and his Rasul Wasallam. He was so busy in his work, that's all he did day and night. At the time of death, that's what he's uttering rather than read the kalima, La ilaha illallah. How many young guys, my young friends, that I know personally, from amongst the believers that have died, you know, in which condition, had a good night out. You know, you and I, with 25 years of age, 30 years of age, 80, you know, you think this is, we ain't even got to our peak, you just can't die. Why? People don't die when they're age of 18. That's so, that's nonsense, that's silly. You know, it just doesn't happen. It doesn't happen to young guys. People that drop a 70 plus, that thought doesn't even cross our mind. But how many from our youngsters, my young friends, have had a good night out, they buzzed out of their heads on seventh heaven after having taken an intox, a tablet or two, and before you know it, his heart's popped and he's gone. His heart's popped and he's gone in the state of intoxication. You know what? He was thinking, that the angel is going to ring him and make an appointment. And when he agrees, that's when his soul will go. How foolish. How foolish. The thought doesn't even cross our minds that we're going to go. The great Jalaluddin Siyuti rahmatullahi has related in his work, Sharh al-Sudur fi Ahwal al mawta wal kabur He says that the ulama write that in general, there are four reasons and four causes for a bad ending. Four causes as a result of which a person will be disgraced at the time of death. And he mentions them. at tahawun bis salat number one. Number two, shurbul khamar. Number three, ukukul walidain. Number four, idha'ul muslimin. And you know what? Finding anyone that doesn't commit at least one of these sins in this day and age, we'll be lucky if we find someone that to some degree doesn't commit these sins. At takasul bis salat, the first one he mentioned was at takasul bis salat, laziness with regards to salah. You know, just being lazy, not neglecting, not missing, having a lazy attitude, just like the munafikin had at the time of Rasulullah. Wala yatun salat illa wa kusala. Having a lazy attitude towards prayer is something that will bring about a bad death. My friends, never mind laziness with regards to salah. Look at our masajid. Our masajid are empty and they are crying. Our masajid are beautiful. But they are deprived of the real beauty and that is obedient servants of Allah prostrating before the Lord of the Arsh and Kursi five times a day. How many people will you find in this day and age, my young friends? Never mind asking anyone else. Let us just ask ourselves. How many people will we find?
from amongst us. From the day Allah made salah an obligation upon us, it became farz upon us. The day we reach puberty to this very day, who from amongst us can say that we've offered every prayer just as Allah ordained and just like Nabi Kareem would do, who from amongst us can say that we've never missed a single prayer? Now the reality of the matter is, lads, and I don't like beating around the bush. The reality is, you know it better than me. The reality is, in this day and age, these type of people, we can count on our, on our hands. Our masajid are crying. Our masajid are empty. Our masajid are dying for believers, true believers, who prostrate before the Almighty Allah. Yet, my young friends, you know as well as I, this is the biggest obligation in Islam. There is no obligation bigger than this. Open the book of Allah. How many times has Allah mentioned the word Salah? To remind us. Every second page, every third page, my young friends, you will get a reminder with regards to Salah. Allah says, He tells you, your purpose in creation. Allah says, وَمَا خَلَقْتُ الْجِنَّ وَالْإِنسَ إِلَّا لَيَعْبُدُونَ مَا أُرِيدُ مِنْهُمْ مِنْ رِزْكٍ وَمَا أُرِيدُ أَنْ يُطْئِمُونَ There is only one reason and one reason why I created you. Why I placed you in the dunya. I created the dunya for you. I created everything within the dunya for you. But you, my young friend, I created for myself. I created you just to see لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسُنُ amala. Who from amongst you will acknowledge me as Allah and he will bow down and prostrate and fulfill his purpose in creation. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created us. The biggest obligation in Islam, open the hadiths of Rasulullah. You will find hundreds of hadiths whenever Nabi Kareem sallallahu was asked the question, أَيُّ الْأَعْمَالِ أَحَبُّ إِلَى اللَّهِ كَيَا رَسُولَ اللَّهِ صَلَّى اللَّهِ وَسَلَّمْ O Messenger of Allah, tell me, which is the deed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves most of all? The answer would be, my young friends, As-salatu ala waqtiha, to read salah in its correct time. This is the deed that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala loves most of all. And if this is our situation and condition with regards to the biggest obligation in Islam, that we struggle to fulfill this obligation, yet, my friends, anything else that we don't struggle, we don't struggle with. We've got time for everything. We've got time for our friends. We've got time for football. We've got time to socialize. We've got time to holiday. We've got time to enjoy ourselves. But you know, five minutes for one namaz, come as come to offer our farz. This is where we cannot find time. Never mind laziness with regards to salah. The next thing he mentioned, shurbul khamar, taking intoxicants. You know, we may not take intoxicants in the sense that even today by the grace of Allah, which is a positive and good thing, that many of us will not touch alcohol. We won't touch a glass of whiskey. Why? Because you know, right from childhood, this has been instilled in our hearts. Don't go even near. So we won't touch a bottle of brandy and things. But tell me my young friends, who from amongst the youth today doesn't take a spliff? Who from the youth doesn't take a spliff? Balki spliff, my young friend. You will find people with beards who read in the front surf, but in their gatherings they'll be taking spliff, and they don't even consider this haram. They don't even consider the haram. What's the difference between two? This is khamar, this is khamar, this is haram, this is haram, this is cursed, this is cursed. Ukukul walidain. Disrespecting mother and father. Today all mothers and fathers are crying. That they don't even have control over children as young as five. You know, as young as five, they will turn around and look up at their mothers and fathers and say, hey, who are you to tell me to do this? Who are you? They will answer back. The hadith which Hafiz al-Munziri has related in Targhib al tarheeb on the authority of Awani ibn Hushim comes to mind. He says, I went to a tribe, there was a tomb near this tribe. And after Asr, this grave opened and he says a man came out of this grave his head was that of a donkey and his body was that of a human being he came out of the grave he he hoed three times like a donkey three times he he hoed like a donkey and after this he went back inside the grave and the grave closed he says i asked the locals with regards to this individual as to who he was and why Allah was punishing him in this manner. So he says that the locals informed me, this young individual, 
he would take alcohol, he would drink, he had the habit of drinking. And when he would drink too much and he would return home in the evening to his mother, just as our mothers do, you know when we're out and having a good night out, haven't told our mothers, our mothers are sleepless, they're not even sleeping, they're waiting us for inside their homes, you know, uh, fearing uh, with regards to our well-being, are we okay, where are we? They're waiting there, my friends, his mother would do the same. When he would return and she would see him intoxicated, to save him from Jahannam and the fire of hell and the punishment of the Akhirah, she would give her son Nasiha and she would say to her son, Oh my son, ittakullah, fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, stay, from, stay well away from this thing, al khamr al ithm This is the mother of all evils, Ummul Khabayth, Oh my son, rizsu min amali shaitan, is a filthy thing, is from the handicraft and works of the shaitan. Fajtanibu la'allakum tuflihun, Oh my son, if you want success, if you want to go to paradise, Paradise, then don't even go near this. Oh my son, do you not realize this, uh, the shaitan through this, that the shaitan through this wants to stop you from the dhikr of Allah and wants to stop you from prayer. When she would give her son the seer in this manner, you know what he would do? He would turn around to his son and uh, mom and say, Oh mom, stop he hoing like a donkey. He would say to his mom, stop he hoeing like a donkey. You know what? The exact same thing happens today. The exact same thing happens today. This particular individual used these words. My friends, we use words which are rife in this day and age, which are no different to the words that he used. What do youngsters turn around to their mother and father? When their mother and father are saving them from Jahannam and the fire of hell, and they're giving them nasiha. What do their sons turn around to their mother and father and say? Oh mother, get off my back. Give, you're always breathing down upon me. You don't, give me you, know, you don't give me a chance to breathe. You're always coming on top of me. Give me chance to breathe. Give me my own space. Give me my freedom. Stay out of my life. This is what the youngsters utter today. My friends, there is no difference between this and what that individual uttered at that time. Those words were rife at that time, these words are rife at this time. Remember, after Asr that young individual died. And after Asr, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala punished him in such a manner that his head is turned into a donkey. He is the one that comes out of the grave and he holds like a donkey. This hadith was related in front of a master of a hadith. Not one single master rejected or questioned it. The last thing is that al Muslimin, troubling the believers in whichever form it may be, whether it's swearing at someone, whether it's bullying someone, whether it's um, you've taken uh, qarz of someone, you've borrowed some money of some, someone, you know, you were given a particular date to pay back, but you have the means, but you're not paying back. Irrespective of how you trouble a believer, whether it's through slandering, backbiting, whatever it may be, my young friends, this is a cause for a bad death. We need to refrain from these four sins which the ulama, in general as believers, we need to refrain from all sins. But especially these four, which Jalaluddin Siyuti rahmatullah has mentioned, are in general a cause of a bad death. Who from amongst us in this day and age, to some extent, whether it's with intention, or whether it's through uh, laziness, or whether it's without intending, my friends, who to some degree doesn't commit this sin? So when this dying, disobedient servant of Allah is on the point of death, Tamimi Dari radiallahu ta'ala relates that Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has said that the Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angel of death, O angel of death, in talik ila aduwi, fa'tini bih, fa inni qad basadtu lahu fi rizkihi, wa sarbaltuhu bi ni'mati, fa aba illa ma'siyati. Allah calls the angel of death, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to the angel of death, O angel of death, Go to this enemy of mine. Go bring this enemy of mine. Go to him, bring his soul to me. I showered him with blessings. I gave him his risk and provisions in abundance. Yet, he refused to acknowledge me. He refused to believe in me. He rejected Allah and his Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He had no time for me. He had no time to prostrate. He had time for everything else. He, found, he thought he was too big for this. Bring him to me. Up to now, I've been patient. I've been tolerant. Bring him to me. 
Today I will make him pay the price. Today I will punish him like none other. Look up, ponder over the words, my young friends, what the Lord of the Arsan Kursi uses. Allah says to the angel of death, Intalik ila aduwi fa'tinibi, go to my enemy and bring my enemy to me. Allah classes this individual as his enemy. This person that rejects, this person that gives preference to the akhirah over the dunya, I mean the one that gives the preference to the dunya over the akhirah, Allah classes his, him as an enemy. What do you think Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will do with those that he classes as enemy? Remember my young friend, you know this is not some Joe blogs from the street. You know a lot of our youngsters have got the attitude, no problem yeah? Raise your sleeves, one to one. How long is he gonna last before me? This is not some sort of Joe Blogs that you may take on. You know, you might get a few a, a few of your yards and friends to take on. You know, we're talking about the Lord of the Arsh and Kursi. We're talking about the Lord of the worlds. Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen. We're talking about the Lord of the entire universe and beyond. The entire universe and beyond. You know, we live in this dunya. And we are fascinated with this dunya which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala indeed has created in a beautiful manner. We're fascinated. There are over billions of people which live on this dunya at this moment in time. Over six billion people that live on the dunya at this moment in time. This dunya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is so big, my young friends, that there is space in this dunya for billions and billions and billions or more people. But what is this dunya in comparison to what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has created out there? This dunya is insignificant. This dunya is meaningless to Allah. It means nothing. It is worthless. So worthless, compare it with the sun. The sun is one star. You know more science than me. You'll be able to tell me better. Take this planet earth and you place it inside the sun and you will be able to place 1.3 million earths in the sun. 1.3 million earths in the sun. Allahu Akbar. Allah is the greatest. The sun is one star. One star. There are stars out there which are millions of times bigger than the sun. You need, you tell me this, that you need millions and millions of stars to make one galaxy. And then you tell me this, that there are zillions of galaxies out there. Let me tell you on top of this, my young friend. After this, whatever you see above, whatever you see above, when you raise your head and you look above, whatever you see above, the zillions and zillions and zillions of galaxies, let me tell you, this is everything there is within the first heaven. Everything there is within the first heaven. And Allah is the creator of seven heavens. Seven heavens. And the distance between the first heaven and the second heaven is 500 years. You know the distance that can be covered in 500 years. At what speed? Only Allah knows. Only Allah knows, but it will take 500 years to get from the first heaven to the second heaven. 500 years from the second to the third, third to the fourth, fourth to the fifth, fifth to the sixth, sixth to the seventh. Every time it will take 500 years. After the seven heavens, you all read the Ayatul Kursi. You all know the Ayatul Kursi. After this, you have the Kursi of Allah. You have the chair of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know these seven heavens that we've just talked about. In comparison to the Kursi of Allah, they're non-existent. They're meaningless. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa has given an example in a hadith. Just to... Give us a little bit of understanding with regards to the seven heavens in comparison to the kursi of Allah. Take a ring from your finger, take it off, the small ring that you have, and place it, let's say, in a desert, the Sahara Desert. It's the biggest desert in the world. You know that ring that we take off from our fingers and place it in the Sahara Desert? What, what comparison is in between the ring and the Sahara Desert? Nothing. 
Nothing. The seven heavens is the ring, and the kursi of Allah is the Sahara Desert. After the kursi of Allah, my young friends, you have the arsh of Allah. وَكَانَ أَرْشُ عَلَى الْمَاءِ You have the arsh of Allah. Again, Rasulullah has given, has explained, so just so that we can understand. Take the ring, place it in the desert. This time, the ring is the kursi, and the arsh is the desert. What is the kursi in comparison to the arsh of Allah? Nothing. Then you have angels which carry the arsh of Allah. Their heads are in the seventh heaven and their feet are in the lowest earth. My friends, then you have the Lord of the arsh and kursi. لا تدركه الأبصار وهو يدرك الأبصار وهو اللطيف الخبير. He is beyond the size of Allah. Who Allah is, what Allah is. The greatness of Allah is beyond the comprehension of my little mind. This is the being that you and I are messing with. And if he classes you as an enemy, then my friend, he will make you pay like none other. He will make you pay like none other. And when Allah sends the angel of death, he says to him, bring him to me. I showered him with blessings. I gave him his provisions in abundance. Whatever he asked for, I gave him and I gave him more. Look at the blessings of Allah upon you, my young friend. If you and I were to count the blessings of Allah, we were to spend our entire life just counting the blessings of Allah upon us, I swear by Allah, our lives would come to an end, but we will not be able to count the blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is how much blessings Allah has given us. Look at the provisions that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. Look at what is our disposal. You know, whereas, whereas at this moment in time, I address you and you listen to, the, to this reminder. You have people in Afghanistan. You have people in Kashmir. You have people in Chechnya. You have people in Palestine. You have people in different corners of Africa. My friends, they are begging the Almighty Allah and they don't even know where their next morsel will come from. They do not know where their next morsel will come from. And their minds are only occupied, Ki Allah, where is this next morsel going to come from? They don't know whether they will be continuing, whether they'll be able to breathe in five seconds or not. This is their concern. Whereas you and I, Allah has blessed so much. Allah has blessed so, uh, so much in this country. You know, tomorrow morning when you wake up for your breakfast and you desire to have cereal, my young friend, Allah Allah has blessed us so much that tomorrow morning when you wake up and you desire a cereal, my friend, Allah has blessed you so much that you're in a position, if you want cornflakes for your breakfast, you're in a position to have cornflakes. If you decide, no, no not cornflakes, I want Weetabix, you're in a position to have Weetabix. If you don't want Weetabix, you want Cocoa Pox, my young friend, you're in a position to have Cocoa Pox. You're in, in a position to have Rice Krispies. You're in a position to have hundreds and different cereals. You know what? If you don't want cereal and you decide, look, today I want biscuits. How many different types of biscuits are at your disposal? You know what? If you decide to have juice instead, look at the different juices that are at your disposal. If you decide to have uh, 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 you know, a, a hot liquid, you decide to have tea, you know, coffee, how many different you know, drinks are at your disposal? This is just for breakfast. Who can deny this? Which individual sitting here or listening to this lecture, wherever may be in this world, my friends, can deny these blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then on top of this, my friends, the hands with which we touch, the feet with which we walk, the tongue that does the talking, the mouth with which we eat, the ears with which we hear, the eyes with which we see. Look at these countless blessings of Allah. You know, this, we've taken them for granted. 
This is why we don't value them. You know, if in this gathering here and now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was to take just one of his blessings, I swear by Allah, this is when you and I will realize the blessing of Allah. You're talking to me at this moment, and I'm talking to you. You're listening to me. The thought has never crossed your mind, or my mind for that sake, that Allah can take away this blessings. You haven't prepared for this. This thought did not come, your, come to your mind before you came in this gathering. You're looking at me, I'm looking at you, and you know what? Whilst you're looking at me, and I'm looking at you, all of a sudden, Allah's taken away your eyesight. Now, there's total darkness in front of you. What do you think will happen? What do you think, my young friend? See if you can ponder this in your mind's eye. You're in this gathering at this moment in time. You're listening to what I'm saying. You're looking at me, and all of a sudden, you cannot see me. You know what will happen? You'll quickly open your eyes again. Okay, what's happened? To see if I can see. But again, you don't know. It's darkness. Now what you'll do is, you'll start looking to your right. Is the darkness just at the front? So you look to the right. And now you're panicking. You're sweating. You're not, you haven't uttered anything to anyone. You begin to look to your right. It's darkness again. You look into your left. There's darkness again. Now my friend, you will feel in a manner like you never felt in your entire life. You will begin to panic. You know, water will literally drip from your body. body. I swear by Allah, you know, within a zillionth of a second, from a totally independent person, you came in this gathering not even thinking this, not even imagining this. You were the biggest out of the big. Do you understand? From a totally independent person, you will leave as a totally dependent one. Never mind getting outside to your home. I swear by Allah, you will not be able to leave this gathering without the assistance and help of your Muslim brother. And now, now, you know, if you were a multi-billionaire and you possessed a billion dollars, and this thing called eyesight was sold on the market, I'm prepared to swear by Allah that you will, sp sense, you will spend your billions just so that you can buy one blessing which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you. In comparison to this eyesight, you know the billions that are in your account will be meaningless. Look at Allah, how Allah showered us with blessings. This is why Allah will say, I gave him everything. I gave him blessings upon blessings. You never asked for them. Tell me my young friend, when was the last time you ever raised your hand and you thanked Allah for these eyes? When was the last time you ever raised your hand and you thanked Allah for all these blessings that he gave you? My friends, you didn't ask for them, but you know what? He was the Arhamul Rahimeen, the Akramul Akrameen, the Ajwadul Ajwadeen. Without you asking, without you begging, without you prostration, prostrating, he would give, he would give, he would give and he would watch you turning your back on him becoming bl blind and deaf to his teachings you had time for everything you had time to watch the uh, Liverpool game you had time to go and chill with your friends you had time to wine and dine but the only thing and being that you didn't have time for for the one that gave you these zillions and zillions of blessings and he weighed he allowed you to make Tawbah, because he accepts Tawbah, he embraces those that turn to him. Till when? Before the soul comes out of your body. He was waiting patiently. Maybe Abdullah today will embrace me. Indeed, he's lived, lived 99 years of sin. Maybe today he will embrace, he, embrace me. Maybe today he will turn to me. But Abdullah didn't. He was still arrogant. Right till death do his part. Allah will say, now bring him. His time's come to an end. He lived a life of sin. He didn't believe. He rejected. Bring him to me today and I will punish him like none other. The angel of death will now go. You think the angel of death will wait? It's the Lord of the Arsh and Kursi. Kun fayakun. When he says, happens, it happens. فَيَنْطَلِقُ إِلَيْهِ مَلَكَ الْمَوْتِ فِي أَقْرَهِ سُورَةٍ مَا رَآهُ أَحَدٌ مِنَ النَّاسِ لَهُ إِثْنَةَ أَشْرَةَ عَيْنَا وَمَعَ سَفُودٍ مِنْ نَاسِ كَثِيرُ الشَّوْكِ The angel of death will go. He will have 12 eyes. لَهُ إِثْنَةَ أَشْرَةَ عَيْنَا وَمَعَ سَفُودٍ مِنْ نَاسِ He will carry a forked mace made out of fire. This mace will have plenty of forks and it will be made out of fire. My friends, he will have with him وَمَعَ خَمْسُ مِئَ مِنَ الْمَلَائِكَ Five hundred angels will accompany the angel of death. He will assume the most horrifying 
and frightening form any human has ever seen. 500 angels are with him. What will they bring? Ma'ahum nuhas. They will bring a piece of copper. Wa jamaru min jamari jahannam. They will bring huge embers of jahannam. Wa ma'ahum siyat min nar. Ta'ajjaj. They will bring with them scourges of fire. They will bring with them whips of fire. This is how he will come to receive the soul of the enemy of the Lord of the Arsh and Kursi. Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'ala relates that on one occasion, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam asked the angel of death. He said, oh angel of death, show me the form that you assume when you come to take the soul of a, a good believer, the sons of the Akhirah, the followers of Rasulullah, the lovers of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa tell me how do you take their soul? So the angel of death said, Ibrahim, turn your face away. He turned his face away. After a short while, he looks at the angel of death and what does he find? He finds a very handsome young man, beautiful of face, beautiful clothing, you know, sweet smell emitting from his body. When Sayyidina Ibrahim saw such a handsome sight, such a handsome sight, he said to uh, say, uh, the angel of death, or oh, angel of death, لَوْ لَمْ يَلْقَ الْمُؤْمِنْ مِنَ السُّرُورِ شَيْئًا سِوَى وَجْهِكَ لَقَفَى If this was the only blessing that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has in store for a believer, just looking at the beauty of your face that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, that would be sufficient. Ibrahim said, okay, now, uh, um, Sayyidina Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam said to the angel of, now I want you to show me the form that you take, assume when you take the soul of a disobedient servant of Allah. The angel of the said, said uh, to Ibrahim, Ibrahim, no. La tutiku dhalik. Even though you, that you're a great Nabi of Allah, you will not be able to tolerate this, O Ibrahim. Ibrahim insisted, alayhi salam. Looked away, after a short while, he looks again. What does he see? He see, what he saw was, a man, black of face, dark black, black clothing. His head is in the heaven. His feet is on the earth. His Body is covered with hair. Under every hair there are flames of fire which are leaping. Flames of fire coming out of his nostrils. Flames of fire coming out of his mouth. Ibrahim wasalam, couldn't tolerate this. He fainted. He fainted. When he finally gained consciousness, he turned round to the angel of death and said, if this was the only punishment that Allah has in store for a dying servant that is disobedient, then that would be sufficient. No other punishment would be required for him. So this is how the angel of death comes to receive this person. Black face, black clothing, flames coming out of his nose, flames coming out of his mouth, flames leaping from every hair. He has in his hand a forked mace made out of fire. 500 angels that accompany him. They have with them pieces of copper, huge embers of Jahannam, and each angel is carrying, scourge, is carrying whips made out of fire. This is how now this army of Allah goes to receive the soul of this dying disobedient servant of Allah. Like I said, you can hide wherever you want. Be it Fort Knox, or be it in the depths of the Atlantic. When your time comes, Allah na kare, hopefully inshallah the angel of death will not come to you and me in this form. Because inshallah, we are obedient servants of Allah, and to the best of our ability, we will remain obedient till death do us part. Inshallah. Well, my friend, for those that don't, you can hide in the Pentagon, you can hide in Four Knox, or the death of some ocean, or the peak of some mountain, North Pole to South Pole. When your time comes to an end, the barrier will be removed, and this is what you will see. This is what you will see. Not those around you. This is what you will see. The angel of death is standing before you. Do you understand? In this form, and my friends, he will strike you with such force, with this forked mace made out of fire, that these forks will penetrate, get stuck in every limb, every bone, every joint, and every vein. Can you imagine the see you can picture it in your mind's eye, your, your body? Every limb, every joint, every vein, there's a fork inside it. Deep inside, penetrated. And while this forked mace and these forks are stuck in every vein and you know, joint and 
flesh. Now, my friends, he will twist and he will turn. You know, it is the pain when they're just inside. You know, that is intolerable. And then, to go a million times further, he will now twist and he will turn. Human mind cannot comprehend this pain. And he will begin to extract the soul. And he will start from the tips of your toes, from your feet. And he will extract the soul and he will stop here where your ankle is. And he will twist and turn. وَلَوْ تَرَى إِذْ يَتُوَفَّ الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا الْمَلَائِكَةِ يَضْرِبُونَ وَجُوهُمْ وَأَدْبَارَهُمْ وَذُوكُ وَأَذَابَ الْحَرِيقِ And you know the angels that have come with these whips made out of fire? They will beat him like never before. Beat him like never before. The body will swoon. He will extract the soul from the ankle. He will stop at the knee. He will twist and turn while the other angels beat. He will then extract from the knees, he will stop at the waist. He will twist and turn and the body will feel pain like never before and the pain will keep on increasing and the angels will beat him. He will now stop here to the chest, twist and turn, the angels will beat. Like this, they will take the soul to the neck. They brought this piece of copper from Jahannam. They will place it here. They brought these huge embers of Jahannam. They will place them here also. Now my young friends, the angel of death will call out, أُخْرُجِي أَيَّتُهَا النَّفْسُ الْخَبِيسَةَ إِلَىٰ سَمُومٍ وَحَمِيمٍ وَذِلٍّ مِّنْ يَحْمُومٍ لَا بَارِدٍ وَلَا كَرِيمٍ Come out or a cursed soul. Yani this soul is, soul is cursed. This is how the angel of death will address it. Come out or a cursed soul to a place of scorching wind. Shadows of black smoke. No cool, no refreshing. Now the soul will come out of the body. The soul is out. What do you think will happen next? My friends, you know when people get caught out, you begin to blame one another. You take blame away from yourself. Now here, your own body and your soul will begin to fight. They will begin to lay blame. The soul will curse the body and the body will curse the soul. Look at, look at the reality. The reality is such, my young friends, that your soul will want nothing to do with this body, and this body will want nothing to do with this soul, and they will both blame one another. The soul will say to the body, Jazakallah anni sharra. May Allah give you a bad reward. May Allah puni you, punish you. Fakad kunta sari'an bi ila ma'siyatillah. Bati'an bi anta'atillah. Fakad halakta wa halak. You were quick in disobeying the Almighty Allah. You were slow in obeying Him. Not only have you destroyed yourself, you have also destroyed me. Me, the soul will be punished, and you, the body, will also be punished. The soul will curse the body, and the body will begin to curse the soul. Here, they're fighting with one another. My friends, now, the earth on which you wronged Allah, and you committed sin, this earth will want nothing to do with you, and this earth will begin to curse you. This earth will curse you, and this earth will thank the Lord of the Arsh and Gursi. Hey Allah, there are lakh, lakh shukriya. Oh Allah, millions and millions of thanks for you, that today you have rid me of the evil of this, servant, of this man called Abdullah. Millions of thanks that you have rid me of the evil. He used to disobey you, he used to commit sin. There are lakh, lakh shukriya that you've taken him away. While this is happening, the army of Iblis, will come to Iblis, they're rejoicing, they're partying, and they will say to Iblis, Oh Iblis, today we have sent one of the sons of Adam to Jahannam. You used to party in the dunya, and at your death, the shaitan and his army is partying. One more, this brings the tally to, uh, tally to 1,500,000. My young friend, now your soul has been taken out of the body. The hadith of Barai ibn Azib says, فَإِذَا أَخَذَهَا لَمْ يَدْؤَ فِي يَدِهِ طَرْفَةَ عِينَ حَتَّى يَجْعَلُوهَ فِي تِلْكَ الْمَسُوءِ The angels that have come with the angel of death, they will not leave the soul inside his hand. Not even for a millionth of a second, you know the time it takes to open and close the eye. Doesn't take long. They will not even leave the soul in his hand for that long. They'll quickly take the soul from him, and the cloth that they brought from Jahannam, they will place the soul inside that cloth. 
Now, وَيَخْرُجْ مِنْهَا كَأَنْتَنْ رِيحَ جِيفَةٍ وُجِدْ عَلَى وَجْءِ الْأَرْضِ You know, this soul will begin to smell. Stink. Literally, it will stink. And you know the smell? You know when... Uh, uh, have you seen a corpse when it's rotting? Something that's died and the body begins to rot. You know, in our house, when sometimes a, a mouse has died between the floorboards. You know, it's intolerable. You can't live with that smell. You know, the worst rotten corpse on the dunya. Just imagine the smell of that. The smell of this soul will be millions of times more worse than this. Now, the journey of the heavens will begin. The angels have taken the soul, they placed it in this piece of cloth, and now the angels are going towards the heaven. Every time this group of angels passes by a group of angels, the group of angels will ask, Ma hadha ruh al khabith. Listen to the words how they address. Ma hadha ruh al khabith. Whose is this impure soul that you take into the heavens? And the angels will say, Fulan ibn Fulan, bi aqba asma allati kana yusamma biha fid dunya. They will say, This is the soul of so and so person, the son of so and so person. And they will call him with the bad names with which he was known within the dunya. You know, when a, when a child is good, People praise the son and they will always praise the father. They will say, MashaAllah, this is Dr. So-and-so, the son of so-and-so. Look how, look at the character, look at the, the, the good work his father did. You know, if he's an Ali, MashaAllah, this is half his so-and-so, the son of so-and-so. And when a person and son is bad, and he's giving taklif to people within the area, then people not only curse the individual, they also curse the father. Okay, look at the way the father brought up this child. So the angels will be no different. They'll say, this is so-and-so, the son of so and so. Now they take him to the heavens. They reach the heavens and they knock on the heavens. My friends, the door will not be open. For him, the door will not be open. This is when Rasulullah recited the verse of the Quran. For him, for these type of people, the door of the heavens will not open. And these people, they will not enter paradise till a camel will enter the eye of a needle. I ask, can a camel enter the eye of a needle? Eye of a needle is so small. A camel is so big, it's impossible. It can't happen. Allah is saying exact same thing. These people that rejected Allah and His Rasul, they will not enter paradise just like a camel will not enter the eye of a needle. And Allah will call out, write the scroll of this person in the lowest hell in the lowest earth. And his soul will be thrown down, hurled down. This is when Rasulullah read the verse of the Quran. وَمَنْ يُشْرِكْ بِاللَّهِ فَكَأَنَّمَا خَرَّ مِنَ السَّمَاءِ فَتَخْطَفُهُ الطَّيْرِ أَوْ تَحْوِي بِهِ الرِّيْفِ مَكَانٍ صَحِيقٍ Whoever associates partners with Allah is like he's fallen from the heaven. And the birds have picked him up or the wind has carried him to a distant land. His soul will be hurled down. Now, my friends, his soul will be returned inside his body, inside his grave. Now it will be the grave's turn. And what will the grave say? The grave will say, Kunta la abghaz man yamshi ala dhahri ilayya. Out of all the people that walked on me, you, Abdullah, was the one I hated most of all. You, O oh Abdullah, was the one I hated most of all. O oh Abdullah, I've been waiting for you all this time. I've been waiting for you to come to me. Now that you have come to me today, Today I will make you pay the price. Today you will know how I will deal with you. At that time, my young friends, the grave will embrace him with such force, such force, that the ribs of one side, they will penetrate into the other side. And Rasulullah practically demonstrated this. He took the fingers of his right hand and he placed them in the fingers of his left hand like this. This is what will happen. This is what will happen. And now, the angels Munkar and Nakir will come. Jibra'il I mean, on one occasion asked Rasulullah, okay, Ya Rasulullah, I want you to describe these angels for me. So Nabi Kareem was told, O okay, oh Muhammad, without telling you the size of these angels, Absaruhuma kal barkil khatif, wa aswatuma kal ra'dil qasif, wa anyabuhuma kal siyasi, wa anfasuma kal lahab, yata'ani fi ash'arihima, bayna man kibay kulli wahidin minhuma masiratu kada wa kada. 
Absaruhuma kalbarki al khatif that their eyes glitter like lightning. Seen a flash of lightning. This is how their eyes glitter. Wa aswatuma karratil qasif. You know their voices rumble like thunder. Wa anyabuhuma kasiyasi. Their teeth are like the horns of a bull. Their hair reach their feet. The distance between their shoulders is miles apart. You know, if you wanted to cover the distance from one shoulder to other shoulders, it would take you days and days. Kanuziyad minum rafa wa rahma illa bil mu'minin. Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was told that in these people there is not even an ounce of mercy inside their hearts. Their mercy is only for the true believers. They will come to everyone. مَا أَكُلِّ وَاحِدٍ مِنُمْ أَمُودٌ مِنْ حَدِيدٍ لَوْ يَسْتَمَعْ عَلِيهِمْ مَنْ فِي الْأَرْضِ مَا حَرَّكُوا Each one of them will carry a hammer of steel. My young friends, all those within the dunya, from the human kind and jinn kind, if they were to get together just to pick up one of these hammers, never mind moving it an inch, they would not be even be able to move it a millimeter. No, even a millimeter. They will come to him in his grave. They will reproach him. فَيَمْطَهِرَانِ إِنْتِحَارًا يَتَقَعْقَوْ مِنْ وَعِظَامُهُ وَتَظُولُ عَذَامِ مَفَاسِلِهِ فَيَخِرَّ مَخْشِينَ عَلَيْهِ They will reproach him in such a manner. Allah protect. That every bone in his body will begin to crack. Every bone, they will reproach him. He will faint. When he comes round, they will ask the three questions. مَنْ رَبُّكْ مَا دِينُكْ مَنْ حَاذُ رَجُلْ يَا هَذَا اِعْرِفْ مَكَانَكْ Recognize where you are. Look around you. The dunya has come to an end. You are now inside the grave. Tell us, مَنْ رَبُّكْ Who is your Lord? Now you and I, we're sitting here and we're thinking, Ya Yaar, I read the kalima, La ilaha illa Allah Muhammad Rasulullah. Who doesn't know the answer to these? Who doesn't know the answer to these? My Lord is Allah, my deen is Islam, and this man is Muhammad. Who does it? These are simple. My young friends, you know, in there, if you haven't lived a life according to the teachings of Allah and His Rasul Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, you know what? Just as those that wine and dine, whilst they're alive, are whining and dining on deathbed, and rather reading the kalima, La ilaha illallah, they're uttering nonsense like, give me intoxicants to drink. If you've spent a life like this, when these angels ask you these simple questions, and indeed they are simple questions, my friends, you will not have the answer. Now this guy was whining and dining. You know when the question is asked, Kaman Rabbuk, who is your Lord? What do you think he will say? Allah says in the Quran, Araita mani takhada ilahu hawa. You know, he was one of those, his God, his Lord was his desire. He didn't listen to Allah, he didn't follow the teachings of Rasulullah. He was following his desires. His desire was saying, you know what, this girl's absolutely, she's dynamite, she's beautiful. Go for her. He was going for her. His nafs was saying, forget Salah, yeah, let's go chill with the boys. Hang out on the street corners. He was doing this. His nafs was saying, you know what, it's not too bad to have a tablet or two, enjoy yourself. You know, you've only got 10, 15 years, life's to enjoy. That's what he was doing. He was listening to every single thing that his nafs was saying. This was his God, so what is he going to say? La ha ha la adri, I don't know. We'll ask him. Man, uh, they're going to ask him, what's your deen? There was no deen in his life, yeah? You know, he believed that, you know, you turn to Allah when you're 70. You know, when you can't pull anymore, you've got nowhere to go. You know, bones are cracking, you've got arthritis, you've become weak wrinkles on your faces. This is what he believed, that you go for hajj at that age. Till then, you know, you enjoy. So what's he going to say? What's your deen? There was no deen in his life. He was just a chiller. Man hadha rajul. Who was this man? He didn't know who Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam was. He read the kalima la ilaha, but he didn't know who Muhammad was. He never followed Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam. He used to follow the likes of, you know, Ronaldo's and the Messi's, the Ronaldinho's. He used to follow people like, you know, these, the movie stars, these pop stars. You know, the way they were combing their hair, the walking the walk and talking the talk and the clothes and the cars. You name it. For him, they were the role models. What's he going to turn around? What's he going to say? He going to have an answer. Ha ha la adri. And at that time, my friends, فَيَضْرِبَانِهِ دَرْبَةً يَتَتَايُرُ الشَّرَرُ فِي قَبْرِهِ They will strike him with that mace, with such force, my young friends, that the sparks will spread throughout the grave. Sparks will spread, and it will be said to him, look above. 
and a door will be opened to paradise. He will look above, he will saw, he, the, a do, the door will be opened to paradise, he will be able to see paradise. He will be able to see the blessings of paradise. And it will be said, Ya Adu Allah, O enemy of Allah, Hada manziluk lo atat Allah. How do you worship Allah? Then this was your abode. But you didn't. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa at that time swore by his life. Walladhi nafsi biyadeh. He swore by his life, you know, at that time. He will feel such regret, the likes of which he's never felt before. You know, that that's when reality will come before his eyes. You know, he's seeing Jahannam. And he knows now that he's been deprived. He knows what's going to happen thereafter. At that time, Rasulullah swore by his life. That, that, that individual will feel such regret the likes of which he's never felt before. A door will be open, open towards hell and it will be said, Oh Adu Allah, Hada Manziluk Lima Asait Allah. Oh enemy of Allah, this is your abode because you disobeyed Allah and the hot fire of Jahannam will keep on entering his grave and he will roast right till the day of judgment. Hadith of Bara ibn Azib, after the questions, a caller will call out. And Kazaba Abdi, for Frishulahu min al-Nar, Walbisuhu min al-Nar, Waftahu lahu babin il al-Nar. Give him the clothes of Jahannam, give him the bedding of Jahannam, and open a door towards Jahannam for him. Thereafter, a man will come inside his grave. Qabihu al-Waj, Qabihu al-Siyab, Muntin al-Ri. This man is ugly of face, his clothes are ugly, he stinks. He will come in his grave. And this man will begin to mock. He'll begin to take the mick. And he will say to him, you know what? Abshir. Abshir bil ladhi yasuak. Good news. Good news. Glad tidings of what? Al ladhi yasuak. Of that which troubles you. Of that which gives you taklif. Of that which brings you pain. Hada yomuk al ladhi kunta tu'ad. You didn't believe. You were just too big to believe. هَذَا يَوْمُكَ الَّذِي كُنْتَ تُوَدْ My young friend, this is the day that you were promised. Allah mentioned it in the Quran, what your outcome will be if you reject. Rasulullah mentioned it in hundreds of hadiths, what your outcome will be if you reject. The a'imma on every Juma would remind you of the consequences. In gatherings like this, you were reminded of these consequences. But you refused to believe. You didn't believe that you were going to die. You didn't believe there will be a Accountability. You didn't believe that the angel will come. Today you will pay the price. And he will ask, And who are you? Your face brings bad news. Who are you? He will turn and say to him, You know the bad deeds that you performed in the dunya? I am those deeds. Allah has given me a body so that you can see what you did in the dunya. And my friends, when he can see his deeds before him in the, in, in, in the form of a body, black body which literally stinks, which black clothing, my friends, he will begin to beg the Almighty Allah. He will now know what's going to happen, my friends, and he will begin to beg the Almighty Allah, Wallah, Rabbi la tuqim as Rabbi la tuqim as Wallah, I beg you, do not bring the final hour. Do not bring the final hour because he knows that whatever happens thereafter will be a million times more severe and it will keep on increasing and increasing and increasing and there is no end. Hadith of Bara ibn Azib says, لَهُ asab abkam." Thereafter, a blind and deaf tormentor will be appointed to torment him. Blind and deaf, why blind and why deaf? So you know, when he's crying inside his grave, and he's begging, and he's shouting, and he's screaming, and tears of blood are flowing from his eyes, and he's begging for compassion and mercy to be shown. These tormentors will be blind and deaf, so they cannot see him crying, and they cannot hear him begging. And they will have a hammer. When they strike it on a mountain, it will turn to dust. And when they strike him, all the khala'iq, the creations of Allah will be able to hear this other than the thakalain, that is the humankind and jinkind. Sayyidina Abu Sayyid al-Khudri radiallahu ta'ala relates 
that Nabi Kareem sallallahu alaihi wasallam said, "Yusallatu ala al-kafir fi kabri tis'atun wa tis'una tanina tunhishu wa tuldighu hatta takum as-sah." Ninety-nine serpents will be sent upon him, and they will keep on biting him till the day of judgment. Such is the venom of one of the my young friends that if it was to sting the earth, nothing would grow on the earth right till the day of judgment. Ninety-nine upon him, and they will keep on stinging him, stinging him right till the day of judgment. Right till the day of judgment. The reality of the matter is, my young friends, different people will receive different punishments. It was the practice of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam that after Fajr salah, he would sit down with the Sahaba and he would ask them, okay, "Have you seen a dream?" Now, if the Sahaba had seen something significant, they would relate, and if they hadn't, they would say, "No, ya Rasulullah." So according to this practice, he asked, has anyone seen a dream? The Sahaba said, no. So Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam began to relate his dream. And Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioned, okay, last night, the angels came, held me by the hand, and they took me to the blessed land, Quds. He says, on the way I came across some people, two men. One was standing, one was sitting down. The one that was standing, he had a hooked rod. Metal hooked rod. And what he would do was, he would rip open the mouth of this person that is sitting down. He would come to one side, let's say the right hand side, and he would begin ripping his mouth. And now this cry, a guy is crying, wailing, shedding tears of blood. But this guy continues. He becomes blind and deaf to his crying. He keeps on ripping his mouth till he reaches the nape. When he gets to this, now he comes to the other side. He begins to rip the other side. As he's ripping the other side, he will find that the right hand side is become better just like it was before. He will rip the left hand side when he reaches the nape. He will go now to the other side. When he goes to the other side, he will find that the other side has become better. Just like as it was. And this process is continuing. From one side to the other, the guy does not even get a second to breathe. Rasulullah asked, what's this? The angel said, continue. They continued. This time Rasulullah comes to another two people. One is standing and one is lying down. The one is standing has got a great uh, this rock stone, huge stone. And he is crushing the head of this person that is lying in front of him. He crushes his head. His head is crushed. The stone rolls at a distance. This man goes to get the stone. In his absence, he finds that the head is exactly as it was. And this process is continued. Again, Rasulullah asks, what's this? They say, continue. This time they come to an oven-like thing. The top part is narrow, the bottom part is wide. Rasulullah can hear people screaming inside. He takes a look inside and he saw naked men and women. There are flames of fire leaping beneath them. And every time these flames of fire leap, these people rise as if they are coming out of the tanur, out of the oven. When the flames become weak, they return. Rasulullah saw these people in this position. Again asked, okay, who are these people? He says, continue, this time they come to a river of blood. A person is inside the river. There's a person on the bank of the river. This one on the bank has stones. This one in the river is trying to swim to get to the bank. When he gets close to the bank, this one on the bank takes stone, pelts him, and he ends up where he is. And this process is continued. Now it's a long hadith, just to conclude. Uh, conclude. At the end, the angels inform Rasulullah with regards to these individuals and why they were being punished. The first person whose mouth was being ripped, the angel said, This one, Kazab, you had this Belkizb. This was a compulsive liar. You know, to, in this day and age, it's fashion to lie. You know, everyone comes out with Jack and Oris and feels good about it. So this guy used to entertain people, I guess, and come out with a load of rubbish. This is the price that he was paying. The second guy whose head was being ripped was one who Allah gave the knowledge of Quran. He was able to read the Quran, but he never read it and never acted upon it. So as a result, his head was being crushed. The third guy, the naked men and women, were those that would fornicate and commit zina. This is the punishment that they were receiving. The one that was inside the river of blood was the one that would wheel and deal in interest. Now this hadith, my young friends, is in the Sahih of Al-Bukhari, the most authentic book of hadith. And the muhaddisin write with regards to this hadith, under this they write, these different punishments that Rasulullah saw, they were the punishments of the barzakh, they were the torments of the grave. So from this hadith you conclude that different people will receive different punishments, depending on the sin that they've committed. And you know what, sometimes Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He actually reveals this. He actually reveals this. Many a time to the pious, many a time in dreams, and you know what, now and then, Allah actually 
reveals this in reality to people like you and me. And the objective is, you know what? Abibi Bazaja, Abibi Bazaja. My friend, you have even now you have time. Refrain, refrain, refrain from sin. Come to Allah and His Rasul. Adopt the teachings. You still have time. This is what Allah gives us the reminders. Abu Abdullah Muhammad ibn Ahmad al Qusri relates that in Istanbul there was a governor. He died. They dug, up, they dug a grave for him. When they were on the verge of lowering this body inside the grave, do you know what they saw inside the grave? They saw a black snake waiting for him inside the grave. They were terrified. Naturally, they were terrified. They didn't want to bury this guy inside this grave. So they dug another grave. Now they've spent hours digging the second grave. They're on the verge of lowering the body inside the grave. And you know what? The same snake they saw in the first is waiting in the second. They dig a third grave. A third grave. And they find when they're on the verge of lowering this grave, all of a sudden, out of the blue, they find the same black snake inside the grave. I ask you, my young friends, you know, on that particular occasion, that narration, what do you think it suggests? How many graves do you think they dug on that day? Four, five, six, seven, eight, ten, fifteen, twenty, twenty-five, thirty graves. <coughs> the narration says that on that day, they dug about thirty graves. Every time the grave was dug and they were on the verge of lowering this body inside the grave, they would find the same blood snake waiting. <laughs> Where are you going to hide? It doesn't come any clearer than this. Where are you going to hide? Where? Allah! You know, even when you've gone six foot under, you can't get away. You've left the dunya, and you've gone six foot under, and you think you've got away with it. This is where it will begin. You know, fed up after digging so many graves, they consulted the ulama. What should we do with this person? May Allah protect us. They said, you know what? Just bury him inside the grave. Leave the rest to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they buried him. In the tarikh of Makrezi in the year 600, a man buried his wife. And by mistake, his handkerchief which had money inside it, fell inside the grave. Now he's gone home, realizing that the handkerchief is inside the grave. He takes one of the local scholars to dig up the grave. Now the scholar standing at the corner of the grave, and this guy is dig, uh, is dug up the grave. What does he? What did he see on that day? He saw his wife is sitting inside the grave, and her hair are tied to her feet. So what he does is interfere in the akhirah, and he begins to tries to untie the hair, trying, trying. He's unable to do so. How is he gonna? be able to make a difference to the Akhirah. But he doesn't refrain. He continues to do so. And what does the scholar witness? Down he goes, and down his wife goes, and there is not a sign of them. And he remains unconscious for one day and one night. When he gains conscience and relates it to the Khalif, the Amir, he in turn wrote to the great scholar of Islam who alive was at the time, the great master of hadith, Muhaddis, Taqiyuddin ibn Dakhiq al Eid, get this as what, what's been witnessed in our land. So the great master of hadith wrote back that this is a reminder. Simple. This is a reminder for people like you and me. Abibi time hai. You know, even now you've got time. Even now you can set the record. You know, just turn to Allah, Allah will embrace. It doesn't have to be like this. This is why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now and then reveals this. Hawarith ibn Rabab was at the time of Umar. He was passing through a place called Athaba. And all of a sudden out of a grave he saw a man come out. His head was on fire and his face was on fire. And he was tied in chains. And he was begging for water. Iskini, iskini. He says all of a sudden another guy came out from the grave following him. Saying don't give the kafir anything. Don't give the kafir anything. He drug, grabbed him by his chains and dragged him back inside the grave again. 
Now obviously, Huwaris ibn Arabah was terrified and so was the Sheikh He said, I lost total control till I got to a place called Irkul Zabiya. That's where I read my Maghrib and Isha and I head straight away to Medina to Al-Manawara to the great Umar Farooq radiallahu ta'ala anhu and I related to him this, uh, this incident which I witnessed. It says Umar Farooq looked into this and it turned out that this man died in the days of ignorance. He belonged to the tribe of Banu Ghifar and the sin that he would commit was he did not fulfill the rights of his guests. Abdullah bin Umar also witnessed a similar incident at the time of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi and he, when he related to the Messenger of Allah, Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam said that was the enemy of Allah, Abu Jahl, and Allah is punishing him in this manner right till the day of judgment. Now, my young friends, just before I conclude, very quickly, let's, let, let us just look at very briefly some of the causes of the punishment inside the grave. It doesn't have to be like this, like I said. Now. As we've seen from the hadith, there are many, many different reasons as to why a person will be punished. But in general, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said hadith of Bayhaqi on the authority of Sayyidina Abu Huraira radiallahu ta'ala Nabi Kareem sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, inna azab al-qabr min thalatha, that in general, the punishment of the grave is as a result of three things, three sins. First, min al ghiba Second, wal bawl I mean, uh, second was wal namima and the third was wal bawl fa iyyakum wa dhalik backbiting ghiba secondly slandering i mean carrying tails and thirdly negligence with with regards to drops of urine in the hadith which imam bukhari and muslim have narrated in the sahih on the authority of ibn nabi karim sallallahu alaihi was passing by uh, once two graves and the people in the grave were receiving punishment so nabi karim sallallahu alaihi said to the sahaba that these people are being punished but don't think they're being punished as a result of something major, no. And then Nabi Karim وسلم, informed them that one of them, he would carry tails, and the second one was negligent with regards to drops of urine. And then Rasulullah asked for a, a fresh palm, he split it into two, and then he planted one on each grave. So the Sahaba asked, Ya Rasulullah, why did you do this? Nabi Karim وسلم, explained, that it's so possible that the punishment will be lightened as long as these fresh palms don't become dry. <coughs> My young friends, who from amongst us to some degree doesn't commit these sins? Especially the first two, ghiba, bug biting, and carrying tails. Especially ghiba, my friends. You know, this sin, rare will you find in any person that to some degree doesn't commit the sin. Even the learned, backbiting people. Now that we know the consequence of this, we need to refrain. And with regards to you know, the, the drops of urine, we need to perform istibra. Now what istibra is? Mulana, I'm going to leave it in your good hands inshallah to address this. But basically, just to sum it up in a nutshell, that we need to make sure that once we've done istanja, that after having done istanja, we need to be sure that no drops of urine come out and pollute our clothes or our bodies. Now those that don't perform istibra, without you even knowing my young friends, you'll be committing the sin. There is no way on God's earth, in general, if you're not doing istibra, that you're not committing this sin. And you won't even know it. You know, sometimes one little drop will come out and you won't even realize. You know, you won't even realize. That, that's all of us included, me included. You won't realize. So this is why it's important that is, uh, uh, you know, once we do istanja, we do istibra. And hopefully, inshallah, Mawlana uh, will shed light on this uh, in a Juma or some fit class. Things that you can do that which will help and save you from the punishment of the grave. And this is something that every one of us can do. And you know, if at least one person acts upon this, then you know what? It's been a good day for me. And you know, even if you don't, it's still a good day. Why? Hopefully Allah will accept. And I'm going to bank the difference in the akhirah. This is what you call banking the difference, guys. You want to be a billionaire? then these are the types of accounts that you need to open. Not ones in Swiss accounts, yard. And you just kid yourself that you're a big billionaire. 
Oh my God, how foolish! How foolish can you get? You open these accounts in the Swiss accounts and you have these billions. Only for them to freeze. <laughs> you know, if this human cannot... I mean, if it doesn't click after this, then when is it going to click? Open these type of accounts and I swear by Allah, Allah will never freeze any one of them. Your account will never be frozen. But you know, you'll be shocked that you, in your, in your, in your mind, you only put a million pounds in there. You know, on the day of judgment, I mean, I, I only know the last word is zillion, I don't know anything beyond that. Yeah? But you know what? Zillion times a zillion times a zillion to the last number, whatever it may be, if there's one, yeah, this is what you will find. This is the return that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives. It doesn't give you 1% or 2%. And this is the type of account that you want to open with Allah. Do whatever good you can. Invest here, invest there. You will not be disappointed. Now, the, the amal that will help you in the next life, Rasulullah said, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, Man qara'a tabarak alladhi bayadihi al-mulk, kulla laylatin mana'allah biha min adhab al-qabr. Whoever reads surah mulk every night, hopefully Allah will protect him from the punishment of the grave. Now, who can't read surah mulk? You know, 29th Juz, the first surah, it's four sides long. Four sides. How long will it take you to memorize four sides? You know, the, even the guy that's got no brain, he'll memorize it. Why? Allah's made the Quran easy. And he's made it so that it can be memorized. This is why kids at the age of five, seven, eight, nine can't even spend, uh, speak their mother tongues but they have the entire Quran inside their hearts. Top end my young friends. And mashallah, you Londoners, you guys have got degrees. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Bachelors and masters and PhDs. You're educated people. The whole world talks about the city of London and the people of London. So Allah has blessed you. How long will it take you to memorize four sides? Two weeks? So, okay, let's say you're lining a line a day, yeah, and it takes you a month. Everyone can do it. And you know what? If it's going to help you so much that whatever I've mentioned today is going to protect you from that, come on, guys. Don't you think you've got a deal and a half? Indeed. In one hadith, Ibn Abbas Tirmizi, a companion of Rasulullah, he set up a tent. He set up a grave and he didn't know it was the grave. Now, all of a sudden, whilst he's inside the tent, he can actually hear somebody inside the grave and he's reading Surah Al-Mulk. So he was shocked. And he related this to our beloved Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Rasulullah, I sat on my tent. Didn't know he was a grave. I sat on my tent on a grave. All of a sudden, I could hear somebody reading Surah Al-Mulk. So Nabi Kareem Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam confirmed, indeed, Hiya Al-Munjiya, Hiya Al-Munjiya, Tunjihim Min Adhab Al-Qabr. That Surah is the protector and it will protect him from the punishment of the grave. But in a hadith with Ibn Asakir is related, a weak hadith on the authority of Anas, a man died, and the only thing that he knew was Surah Al-Mulk. So, you know, the reason I'm relating this, you know, people, are, there are many guys that don't know how to read the Quran. Yeah, this guy only knew Surah Al-Mulk, only Surah Al-Mulk. Now he's died, he's inside his grave, and Allah sent the angels to punish him. The angel of punishment comes inside his grave. The angel of punishment comes, Surah Mulk is also there and is standing between him and the punishment. So the angel says, move out of the way. You're, the, you're from the book of Allah and I don't want to harm you, but I haven't got a choice. Allah has told me to punish him. If you want to intercede and protect him, then go ask the Lord of the Arshan Kursi. The surah will go to the Almighty Allah and say, oh Allah, you know this servant of yours, out of your entire book, he would intend for me and he would come and recite me. Oh Allah, are you going to punish him today with the fire whilst I'm inside his heart? And if you're going to do this, oh Allah, then I want you to remove me from your book. Allah is the Arhamul Rahimin, the Akramul Akramin, the Ajwadul Ajwadin. He needs excuses, my young friends, to give you paradise. Will you give him that excuse? You know, every time you do a deed, 
let this thought come across your mind. You know what? Maybe this is the one. And I swear by Allah, you will do many good deeds. And every time you sin, let this thought cross your mind. You know what? Maybe this is the one as a result of which Allah will send me to Jahannam. And you know what? You won't commit any sin. When you do good, let the thought cross your mind. Maybe this is the one that will Allah will like and He will give me paradise. And when you wrong, let this thought cross your mind. Maybe this is the one that He will hold me to account for and you will never sin. So the, the, the surah will say, oh Allah, take me out from your book. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, it seems that you've become angry. The surah will say, oh Allah, do I have the right to become angry? He would recite me and you're punishing him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will say, your intercession has been accepted. You do with him as you please. This very surah, four sides. You're learning a line a day, my young friends. Topen, it'll take you a month or two. Topen comes to his rescue. Saves him from the punishment of the grave, will come, place his mouth on his mouth and say, Marhaban bihaz al fam, for Rubama ma'ani, Marhaban bihaz al sadr, for Rubama wa'ani, Marhaban bihatain al kadamatain, for Rubama kamatwe, Marhaban bihaz al fam, for Rubama talani. Okay, what to say of this mouth that would recite me? What to say of this heart that would that had memorized me? And what to say of these feet that would stand with me in prayer and recite me inside prayer? And thereafter, the surah will stay with him inside his grave so that he doesn't become afraid. You're going to get your money's worth, guys. This is something that every one of us can do. There are other deeds also, but we've got no choice in this matter. Let's say, for example, dying on Jummah. I haven't got a choice in this, and no, have you got to enjoy this? You know, if you're one of those that are lucky, okay, then Alhamdulillah. Because Rasulullah sallallahu said, مَا مِنْ مُسْلِمٍ يَمُوتُ يَوْمُ الْجُمَعُ وَلَيْلَةِ الْجُمَعُ إِلَّا وَقَالَ اللَّهُ مِنْ فِتْرَةِ الْكَبَرِ Whoever dies on Jummah, Allah will save him from the punishment of the grave. Whoever dies, مَنْ مَا تَمُوا رَابِتًا You know, uh, protecting the boundaries of Islam. The boundaries of Islam, not only will he be saved from the punishment of the grave, he will receive the goodies that he would perform, and he will also be saved of the terror when Israfil blows inside the horn. Now the easiest of these deeds is to read Surah Al-Mulk. And I assure you, once you've memorized it, no, literally it will take you not more than three minutes. You know, by the time you leave the masjid and sit in your car or get to your house, you'll have read it. And when the, sahab, when, you know, uh, uh, the hadith of Anas which are related was mentioned, Rasulullah mentioned it to the sahaba, لَمْ يَبْقَى صَغِيرٌ وَلَا كَبِيرٌ وَلَا حُرٌ وَلَا عَبْدٌ إِلَّا تَعَلَّمَهَا Every young, old, Free man and slave memorize and learn the surah, surah al-mulk. I conclude with the way I began. Al-kayyisu mandana nafsuhu wa amila lima ba'd al maut My friends, what I've said today, you've heard before. You've heard before, you've heard today, and you will hear again tomorrow. It's meaningless. If it comes from one ear, and it leaves the other, then it's meaningless. This is why I relate this hadith as I began. The clever man is he. Mandana nafsuhu who controlled his nafs. Who suppressed it? The nafs is whispering, let's go out and chill. Let's wine and dine. This girl looks beautiful. Let's spend some time there. Take a tablet or two. Sell a few tablets here. Make a quick few pounds. No, he suppresses it. Why? No, because Allah and His Rasul prohibited this. And He's suppressing it on one side, and He's pleasing Allah and His Rasul on the other side by working for the real life. And Sayyidina Ali, what did he say? فَكُونُوا مِنْ أَبْنَاءِ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا تَكُونُوا مِنْ أَبْنَاءِ الدُّنْيَا Become the sons of the Akhira, do not become the sons of the dunya. It's so foolish, don't you think guys? How long will we live for? hundred years? Not every guy makes a century, do they now? Not every guy makes a century. You saw what happened to England today. Yeah? And even if you made a century, what's that century in comparison to the Akhirah? You live for a hundred years. How long do you think accountability is? كان مقدار خمسين ألف سنة 
The day of judgment is 50,000 years long. 50,000 years long. Oh Allah. You live for a hundred and you're paying the price 50,000. That's just on the day of judgment. How foolish that would be. That we live for a hundred and we pay the price for 50,000. That's just on the day of judgment. After that, my young friends, it's eternity. It doesn't come to an end. So isn't it more wise? Isn't it wise for this, you know, 50 years that Allah gives us in this dunya, 60 years, we obey Him, and you know what? I swear by Allah, Allah will give you paradise in the dunya. You know, if you obey Him, you know, this heart of yours will always be up there, it will be in seventh heaven. You will feel good. You won't be stressed out, your, uh, you know. You know, you won't have a million and then commit suicide at the same time. It just won't happen. This is how good you will feel within. And then, you know, within 50 years that you spend like this, what do you receive in return? You're receiving eternity. You're receiving zillions and zillions and zillions and zillions of years of mazeh, of bliss, of pleasure. You know, at the end of the day, like I said, it's all about understanding. Allah give me the tawfiq to understand. Allah give me the tawfiq to act upon the message that I convey to others. And then Allah give you the tawfiq. Wa akhiru dawana alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen.